Hi, today we're going to interview longtime activist uh, Matt from ABC, who used to be involved with Food Not Bombs a long time ago and uh, many other projects. Uh, thank you for being here today, Matt. Well, thank you for having me, Jay. Uh, we're going to ask you a lot of um, questions today. Uh, not a lot of important questions. We're going to do this in one take. So uh, we're going to ask 10 questions with Matt from um, ABC. Okay. Before I ask the question, this this number one is important. Question one is important because uh, on social media, a lot of, um, this is during last year, during all the BLM action was going on. People are posting stuff against anarchists, blame the anarchists, or anarchists are hijacking it, this and that. I was just reading all kinds of stuff. So question number one, no matter how many workshops, books published on the history of anarchism, interviews and public outreach, Anarchism is stigmatized on the news near every time when things get broken or things are set on fire. People post on social media that anarch anarchy is to blame or the anarchists are. These ideas are put forward by activists as well. So what is anarchism and why is it relevant? Okay. Um, well, in terms of how I define anarchism, um, I kind of see anarchism as sort of a theory and practice uh, that it examines the world uh, through understanding and critiquing power relationships, right? So we kind of look at things like, um, we look at, at power um, and we see that when power is, is sort of imbalanced, when one has power over another individual, um, we usually sort of view that as something that is ultimately unhealthy and we seek to correct that. Um, so anarchism, when anarchism sort of really began to shape as a political theory, oftentimes it would look at things like the church, it would look at things like state and capital, um, and it would sort of uh, break down and, and challenge those, the hierarchies built around those things, the power dynamics built around those things. Um, I think certainly over the last century and more so in the last four or five decades, we've sort of expanded our critique where now we're beginning to sort of look at things like gender and race, sex, uh, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, uh, looking at culture, things like citizenship. And now we're beginning to sort of, uh, sort of use our analysis of examining power and power dynamics uh, to sort of break down and deconstruct and criticize uh, those things and trying to find alternatives to that. So. Uh, and when we're looking at sort of alternatives to, to these different forms of uh, imbalance or power dynamics in our society, we sort of try to uh, gravitate around these uh, basic ideas of things like mutual aid, solidarity, freedom, and, and equality. So uh, like I said, uh, to me, anarchism is, is examining the world through, through the lens of examining power dynamics, viewing power dynamics, as something that when one has power over the other is something that is inherently unhealthy and trying to find um, more healthy forms of organizing uh, and community and relationships. So um, I think in terms of why, we, why we're getting such bad press, one, I mean, I think we need to understand that anarchism sort of encourages people to um, examine with a critical eye um, the very pillars of our society. So things like hierarchy, capitalism, power. Um, and we're attempting to push people to sort of reject those things. Um, and, you know, that it's as anarchism is also something that sort of fosters and creates and encourages people to develop an imagination and a vision that's sort of beyond the current status quo. So we're looking at people to sort of you know, examine all of these unhealthy dynamics that exist in our society and begin to try to actively try to change those things. So we are seeing, you know, anarchists in, you know, we're looking at things like the Black Lives Matter movement. We are looking at, you know, anarchists certainly participating in those things uh, because of the fact that we see racism and institutional racism, cultural racism in our society as something that is inherently unhealthy. Um, and so, you know, we're going to be a part of those those pushes to try to create change. Um, I think, however, anytime there's a protest, regardless of whether or not it's peaceful or, or violent, um, oftentimes those things are gonna be villainized. And, um, and you know, anarchists historically 
uh, have often been villainized. And so when we're active and we're supporting different movements and there is acts of violence, it just, uh, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the police and the state, it becomes easy to sort of just blame those things on anarchists. I'm not saying that anarchists aren't involved in these type of protests, regardless of whether or not they're violent or nonviolent, but oftentimes if you demonize these movements uh, by saying that you've got violent anarchists that are a part of it, uh, then uh, the state can often try to uh, villainize those social justice movements as well. So, um, you know, I, I think what anarchists should be doing oftentimes is, you know, there is certainly the work that, you know, in terms of being active in protests and demonstrations, but, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of good work that anarchists have done uh, that, you know, maybe that we should be more active in. And a great example is when uh, Katrina took, uh, Katrina happened, um, you know, there was a vibrant anarchist movement to go down there and, and help and provide solidarity to uh, those regions and areas that were impacted by that. Uh, you kind of mentioned food, not bombs. That's, you know, one of those uh, anarchists or anarchist leaning organizations that does really sort of positive work in terms of supporting the homeless communities uh, and challenging uh, the military industrial complex. I think anarchists need to be more active in sort of building community like that and supporting community um, and, and um, being more open about being anarchists. So hopefully, you know, that can build a better sort of understanding about what we are and what, what our beliefs are, if I'm making sense to you. Question number two. In the past, we knew few people who were involved in Black Bloc. I'm not going to mention names, but we knew them well. One of the people I'm referring to was in Black Bloc and was wanted by police for smashing windows of a Burger King and McDonald's. All thought he was not a vegan or vegetarian, so his motives were questionable from day one. During the World Trade Organization protest, which is WTO protest, as it seemed, he enjoyed being destructive. He later transitioned into the alt-right movement. Another so-called anarchist we knew shot off a gun during an ABC gathering to scare people off. And he also used to attend protests for immigrant rights, but he would incite violent behavior by assaulting counter protesters, seem seemingly for his own joy of being violent. We find out later that they joined the alt-right movement as well and continued to act out violently. These former anarchists are just two of the many of these violent people who ended up going to alt-right movement groups to continue their violent behavior. Overall, how can we discourage this behavior? How can we protect our movement from people who are involved to use it as a platform for violence to solely fuck shit up and present us in damaging light? You know, I think that, you know, the reality is that when we're dealing with movements that tend to be on the edges of, of our society, um, I think that these movements tend to attract individuals that uh, are, are, are searching. Um, they're trying to find something that will sort of define them and uh, try to give their life uh, purpose, give their life meaning. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of our beauties and, and our curses, if you will. And, and I think that, you know, look, you know, ABC has certainly found uh, over its years that ABC, our local organization has existed since 2000, I'm sorry, since 1998. And over that time, we've had individuals that have sort of come into our space. Um, and we have found that there are individuals that can be problematic, right? And, um, you know, oftentimes these individuals tend to be short lived in our community. They create uh, a lot of, of conflict and then they tend to sort of move on. And then uh, years later, we'll find that they, they pop up in some other movement, some other community that is oftentimes even completely contradictory than what our values are. Um, so it's, you know, and, and it's become such a trend that it's not surprising when it happens. I think what's, what's most important is that we as a community need to figure out, we as a movement need to figure out how to make sure that we um, best prepare for this. Because if we're, you know, since the anarchist movements and radical movements have always existed, there's always been these elements that have come in and have moved on. So, you know, the reality is what do we need to do to make sure that we're best prepared? So I think one of the things that we can do is really sort of um, strengthen and, and build a sense of community 
uh, within our movement. Um, you know, because I think that the stronger uh, we, uh, the stronger our community is, uh, the better prepared we are to sort of address these individuals, uh, address these issues as they as they happen, um, as they take place. And in addition to that, with a strong community that does create dialogue. So when situations do happen, we can discuss how to better address those issues. Um, I think tied to that is also about having sort of clear principles and ideas and our movement. You know, what, what are our values? What are our ideas? And, and really sort of stay true to those. You know, as, an, uh, as the anarchist movement, we have, like I said, we have a certain set of beliefs in terms of challenging power dynamics and trying to find ways of decision making, ways of, of developing a community, personal relationships that are based on more egalitarian sort of um, dynamics and or principles. And so when we begin to see individuals who are sort of beginning to deviate from that, then you know, we, you know, we need to be uh, prepared and we need to be willing to actually challenge that, those dynamics as they're playing out. Um, you, know, you kind of, in, as part of your question, raise some examples of, of individuals and how they sort of engage in what I would consider sort of aggressive um, and problematic behavior. Um, you know, I would actually say, from my recollection of those moments, we weren't always the best in terms of challenging those, those individuals when, we, when they began to sort of act out in that sort of way. So we also need to be um, confident enough uh, to basically confront individuals and actions uh, and, and any sort of harmful sort of behavior that they're, they're, they're beginning to sort of, uh, that, are, that are sort of playing out, right? Um, and I think lastly, you know, and, and I hate saying this just because it's sort of this mantra in our movement, but it's also being smart about security culture. Um, you know, being smart about who you have around you, um, being smart about what you're saying, uh, what your group is doing, what is being discussed uh, publicly and openly, and then also just being smart in terms of, of you know, who's trying to get, uh, who's trying to do what. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking back in recent cases that we've had where you know, individuals have uh, convinced and, and uh, convinced some individuals to do stuff that they shouldn't have done. The Cleveland Four, as an example, um, you know, who were you know, you know, young activist kids who were or, or young activists who were basically convinced to do some, you know, you know, some ill-advised stuff, and because of that, they were uh, caught in a in a criminal case and convicted. Um, so I think you know. As much as we talk about security culture, I think that there there needs to be a uh, understanding of what that is, and then also practicing that. So, um, I think those sort of things are things that we can do to at least make sure that we are uh, protecting ourselves from individuals that are sort of coming in, um, who you know uh, may not necessarily be the, the the healthiest people with the best of intentions. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I think that some people are. They don't have a belief just, just in it for violence. So when there's no violence going on from that movement, they'll, they'll jump into another movement wherever the violence is. I mean, that's my, I don't know. That's you know I what what I, and what I'll say is that there was um, <laughs> there was a guy uh, in Orange County, um, Johnny Benitez was his name, and um, Johnny Benitez was uh, tried to get involved in uh, various different organizations in Southern California. Uh, of which ABC was was one of, um, and you know I mentioned his name only because of the fact that he was an individual. One, I think th I'm pretty sure that's an alias, but two, there was an OC Weekly article that was uh, that basically uh, highlighted and tracked his his activities. But he tried for many years to be a part of of you know the anti police brutality movement here. He tried to join our organization, tried to join the Industrial Workers of the World. Uh, any leftist organization he tried to join. One of the things that really sort of began to um, really sort of uh, catch the eye of, of a lot of folks was one, he tried to sort of position himself uh, more and more into leadership roles. Um, and then he also tried to sort of push himself into some of the sort of more sensitive uh, areas such as like 
the finances, right, of different organizations um, and making sort of big grandiose sort of promises about what he'd be able to deliver. Um, and so, you know, certain groups, our group, uh, including uh, or including ABC, just didn't feel right about the guy. There was something about him. And so he never really sort of successfully joined our organization. But then, you know, within a year, he became one of the major leaders of the um, Proud Boys in Southern California and the alt-right and, and all of that stuff, you know, very much consistent with the question that you're, you're asking. And, um, you know, but once again, here's an individual that sort of was trying to find something in my view, uh, was trying to sort of step into leadership roles and trying to really sort of dictate the, the sort of the direction of organizations, not really understanding like, you know, with, within the sort of anarchist decision-making structures, uh, it's not one person, you know, one person doesn't really have the ability to sort of push the agenda of an organization or at least they shouldn't. Um, and so because of the fact that he couldn't be, if you will, the leader of these various different organizations, he finally found a, a niche to where he can be the person in the limelight, he can be the leader. And, uh, and then all of a sudden that group and community that he was once claimed to be a part of, which was our movement, he is now rallying against. And now he's speaking as an expert because of his very, very brief moment um, where he was trying to be the leader of the anarchist movement. You know, and, and, you know, we can look at the individuals that you're mentioning and your question, you know, examples that I'm familiar with, and I can say that that same, same thing applies to those individuals. Um, they were individuals that were trying to find purpose and meaning, trying to, try to establish themselves in some way, um, but because of the fact that it didn't play out the way they wanted or their vision of sort of their romantic vision of themselves didn't play out that way, they jumped into the next cause. And Sooner or later, they'll something will happen. Well, they'll fall out of that movement as well. And I think, as a matter of fact, Johnny Benitez has actually already done that, at least with uh, Orange County and the Proud Boys and that kind um, and those movements. So, so yeah. But like I said, the things that we can do more than anything else, making sure we have a strong community um, that is able and prepared to be able to deal with this kind of stuff. You know, make sure that we have a clear understanding of who we are, what our principles are, being able to push back or at least uh, address those, uh, those individuals when they begin to manifest sort of behavior that is in conflict with our ideas. Um, and then also being smart in terms of, you know, having some level of security culture. So I think those are things that we can do to at least minimize the risk. Question number three. There have, there have been a couple of times where there are animal liberation prisoners who have been released from prison and they end up being accused of beating on women, are an abuser, rapist, or have sexually harassed women, and are told they may not speak at shows or events. I have received emails and calls from friends who have said women have contacted them, who have said not to book, book a person as a speaker. As an example, when I lived in Los Angeles, I was going to fly in an animal rights, animal liberation prisoner to be a guest speaker at an event, and two women call for an emergency meeting with me to not book them. I like to explore how we can support the rehabilitation of these abusers in that our community can get them help in making a change. Instead of isolating them, that we can address them within our community so that they may discontinue harming others. How can we support these women, but also be fair to both parties to see if there is a way to do the right thing? Well, you know, I think first and foremost, you know, we need to go back to what our, our principles are as an anarchist movement. And the principles of our anarchist movement is, is trying to challenge destructive, toxic behavior um, uh, and things that, that basically don't promote healthy, healthy relationships, right? And so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, our number one priority should be challenging toxic, predatory and destructive behavior in our movement. Um, and, and as part of that, it also about creating, um, you know, spaces where we're not only having discussions and challenging those sort of things, but we also want to make sure that we create a safe space for individuals that have been the, the, the victims of, of that type of behavior. And oftentimes I would say that our movement, the failure of our movement has that has been that we have tended to 
address these type of problems that you're talking about in such a way to where it pushes women out from our communities uh, or victims. Um, you know, I think in the, the way your question is shaped, we're talking about, you know, more or less, you know, women by the way that the, the question is shaped, but I think really anybody who's a victim towards any sort of toxic or predatory behavior, um, we tend to oftentimes deal with problems in such a way to where the victims are the ones that tend to leave and the victimizers are the ones that tend to sort of be allowed back in our community. And I think that we really need to, before we even begin to talk about uh, past of restorative justice, I think that we as a community need to sort of really reflect on what we're doing to people that are, are victims of, of these type of assaults. Um, you know, and, and I, I can think of one example several years back well over 15 years ago, I think we actually had an individual that joined our organization. And shortly afterwards, we became aware of an incident that took place several months prior to this individual joining our group. Um, that in fact, uh, he was accused of, of a sexual assault. And so um, our organization, what we tried to do was we tried to reach out to the women in our community to seek direction. and. Um, you know, we were given basically a list of things that we needed to kind of work on with this individual. And if that individual failed, uh, that we would remove this individual from our organization. And so we were trying, if you will, to sort of create a form of restorative justice. Um, the reality is, however, we failed. And one of the ways that we failed is we didn't make sure that the woman that was, you know, the victim, um, that she she got the proper support that she she needed and she ended up ultimately moving or leaving the the movement and uh this individual ended up really uh the individual that we were dealing with um you know more or less kind of used the situation and and, and, and continued to use it in a harmful and destructive way um, and develop sort of a status around him trying to quote unquote change. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, I, I think that trying to find ways to bring people in and get people to sort of correct their path, I think is, is a good thing. But I think that where we're at as a movement right now is us being more aware of where we're failing the victims of these type of behavior. Um, I think that really needs to be something that we need to focus on uh, as individuals, as organizations, as, as communities. Uh, because too many times I've seen situations where uh, victims have come forward and um, oftentimes they didn't get the support that they needed from the communities. And so they ended up find, uh, feeling that they didn't have a safe space within the community. Um, and so part of that means that we're gonna have to make very hard decisions that when a community comes forward and says, look, this individual is an individual that has been accused of this and it hasn't been willing to address those issues. We need to be willing to sort of support um, the victims in our communities by you know, standing strong with them. Um, you know, and I think that needs to be the first step. Um, I do think that, like I said, I do think that restorative justice is something that we need to sort of develop in our community. But uh, to be honest with you, I think that we've failed in our first step which is trying to find ways to, to support the victims of, of, of um, sexual assault, of aggression, of you know, this sort of really toxic behavior. Yeah, I brought that question up because this happened a long time ago with the animal rights speaker, long time ago, and then they mm -hmm. called me for emergency meeting that happened recently, then all of online, this and that. Not only in the animal rights movement, even um, way before COVID, every time we're in a band, get an email from someone, don't play with that band, don't have that band on the bill because it's certain so-and-so an abuser. Also, a um, friend of mine who used to volunteer Shea Cafe at that time, when the summer when all the bands were touring, even with bands, it would, they said, yeah, once a week we would get anonymous email saying so-and-so is abuser, you're booking a band that has abuse it. It's like so hard. Like really well, and, yeah, and, and, I, and I think, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, we, one, you've got all these different movements that tend to mesh together, like, you know, and you know more as well as I do, because you're part of both the anarchist movement and the punk movement. And, and you know, as much as there's a lot of talk about issues of addressing things like, you know, transphobia and homophobia and sexist behavior. 
um, the reality is that, you know, we, you know, we have a lot of problems in our community in terms of, I mean, just like any other part of our society as a whole, we have as much as we have the rhetoric of being anti-sexist. Um, the reality is that, you know, you know, we have that problem in our community. And the question is, is once again, what are we going to do to address those issues? One, I think that men need to be much more engaged in challenging um, sexism and, and like I said, homophobia, transphobia, but certainly, you know, um, how we treat um, uh, the women in our movement and, and, um, and dealing with these issues when these issues arise, are we going to be standing in solidarity with, with the victims? Or are we going to be sort of, um, you know, trying to find a reason or explanation because of the fact that we like this band or we like that individual or we like this group, are we going to try to sort of find ways to find an excuse to to allow these these people back into spaces? And I think ultimately the effect of that is not only does it create contradictions in our community, but it creates sort of this toxic environment which is going to cause a lot of victims or you know uh, or you know a lot of victims if you will to sort of feel that this isn't a safe space for them um and you know it's not something um you know it's something that we need to be much more serious about be much more supportive about um so you know i think rather than us talking about how can we bring in more restorative justice i think we need to start back at that first step which is how do we be stronger allies in situations where we need to step up and be, and be stronger allies, period, right? So, yeah. Cool, thank you. Okay, question number four. Because you have personally toured people in Los Angeles about the history of anarchism in the area, can you tell us how far does the anarchist movement date back to in Los Angeles? Can you give us a short history on it and why is it no longer as prevalent? Um, the history of anarchists in Los Angeles uh, sort of uh, began at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, you know, the earliest reports were anarchists were active around uh, Central Park. Um, and uh, there was a vibrant free speech movement that was active uh, in, in that area. Around 1906, you begin to see um, the emergence of the Magonista movement uh, here in Los Angeles. Um, and that really, the Magonista movement really defined the anarchist movement here in Southern California uh, for the first uh, first two decades, um, you know, between 1906 and around 1924, um, when you uh, saw the, um, you know, you already saw at that point, the Magonista leadership already being in prison uh, for sedition. And uh, you uh, you begin to see the Magonista movement sort of dissipate. Around that time, um, they as they were shifting, they were actually kind of shifting more over to East LA, Boyle Heights. There were there was an increase of um, uh, Russian Jewish anarchists coming from the East Coast that began to establish themselves in Boyle Heights, and um, they sort of took root uh, and were active there for the next you know uh 20 30 years around the boyle heights east la area um and uh there's a guy uh there's a guy dave struthers that has written a really good book um documenting that so um he's actually a local anarchist uh historian and so um uh, the name of the book escapes me escapes me right now but if you look up dave struthers um, and anarchism uh, i'm sure you'll be able to find it but he does a really really good job documenting that um you know, you and I were certainly involved in the 80s and 90s and the era of anti-globalization. And, um, you know, you were certainly involved in the peace punk movement. Um, you know, it is very, very, very vibrant during the 80s and 90s. Uh, in terms of why it's no longer so prevalent, um, you know, I think it is in some regards. I just think that the focus isn't so much on what it used to be. I think that, you know, we have all, I do think that we have a lot of anarchists in Southern California, but I think that most of the work that is being done is being done probably around uh, dealing with issues of uh, anti-racism, um, anti-fascism um, and that kind of stuff. I know our era, you know, in terms of, you know, there's a lot of the 
anarchists that are still around, but most of us are either involved in the labor movement or education. So, you know, we're still there. We're just doing different types of work. We're not standing in front of a McDonald's protesting um, McDonald's. Now we're involved in, in other type of community organizing. So, but we're here. I just don't think that we're as much out in public waving black flags as much as we used to. Okay, oh, before I go to the next question, Matt, I just wanted to make it clear. I'm not anti-communist or anything. I'm open-minded. I like to read up on all kinds of stuff and all that. But this is because like, um, actually a couple of years ago, I went to a May Day rally up here and I was marching and I asked some questions. There was red flags everywhere when they didn't march. So like they were chanting, what do we want? Communism, what do you want it now? And I was going, holy shit, this is so embarrassing. I made a U-turn and left the rally. I was going, fuck, this is so embarrassing. They go, what do we want? Communism, what do you want now? So the question I want to ask you is, can you explain what, can you explain what Mayday is and why Mayday is so popular with communist groups? And when it was, I mean, why is Mayday so popular with communist groups when it was founded by anarchists? Well, okay, so first and foremost, Mayday wasn't necessarily created by anarchists in, in, in a sense. It was actually a, a mobilization of the labor movement um, uh, in 1886 around the struggle for the eight hour workday. And uh, various different organizations, the Knights of Labor being one of them, which was not an anarchist organization by any stretch of the imagination, um, were basically making a call. Now, uh, for, for a general strike in support of the eight hour day. Uh, now, why it's associated with anarchists is because in Chicago with the Chicago Labor Co uh, Council, uh, that had a stronger connection with um, with anarchists. Uh, the, uh, the the labor movement in Chicago at that time was much more radical than um, you know uh, certainly some of the other places in the United States, and uh, was led by a lot of le uh, um, labor activists who happened to be um, anarchists. And so, how it became attributed to us was after the May Day rally in 1886, uh, there was um, a strike that had been taking place um, at uh, this place called McCormick and um, strike breakers were brought in. And this was during, like I said, on May 1st, there was a general strike. The general strike continued um, uh, in different cities that, you know, sometimes, it, you know, in some places, the general strike ended uh, on May 1st. Some cities like Chicago, they tried to continue the, the general strike. And so a lot of places were still uh, engaging in, 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 stri in strike actions. McCormick was certainly one of them and uh, a bunch of strike breakers were brought in and there was a conflict that took place where there was a clash, uh, police opened fire and there was um, uh, some people were killed in the process. So uh, on May 4th, 1886, there was a call for a rally uh, at um, uh, Haymarket Square uh, to protest basically what had taken place. Uh, during that event, uh, somebody had thrown an explosive still to this day, it's really not known who did, um, but the police, uh, uh, police officer uh, was killed. There was gunfire where police opened up and began shooting people, including shooting some of themselves, and a lot of people died. Um, and so um, the labor leaders that were connected with uh, the strike, the McCormick strike, as well as the protest were basically rounded up. Um, there were, you know, a lot of people rounded up, but ultimately eight individuals uh, were tried. And so they weren't necessarily tried with throwing the bomb. They were ultimately tried because they were anarchists and that they had, had incited the incident, incited the protests that led to uh, that led to the um, uh, to the bombing, and um, and and some of the individuals weren't even there uh, at during the protest. So ultimately, eight were tried, um, and uh, all eight were convicted. One of them, uh, Louis Lang, uh, killed himself uh, before he was supposed to be executed. Ultimately, four were hanged and three were uh, sentenced to prison, and I believe it was they were sentenced to like 15 years in prison. So um, that's why May Day is oftentimes attributed to to anarchists because the individuals that ultimately were were killed and martyred 
um, were happen to be anarchists. Now, how it's become associated with um, with communists, you know, I think one you need to understand that the the Red Scare during that period of time that took place after after that um, targeted mostly anarchists. Um, and then, you know, as you know, certainly we saw the rise of the Soviet Union, and there was a uh, that basically took May Day as a national holiday. Uh, communists uh, around the world, much like anarchists, began to uh, celebrate May Day. But as the communist movement began to grow, it became more associated with them than with the anarchist movement. Um, so yeah. Hey, so during the Red, Red Scare Day in America, okay, a long time ago, so it, even if you were anarchist, if you don't agree with them, you get labeled as a communist back then? No, well, no. So there's been different waves of, of the Red Scare. Um, you know, Red Scare just wasn't in the 1950s. We had a Red Scare right after the, the Haymarket incident. Uh, we also saw the Red Scare during the uh, during World War I uh, and then also at the end of World War II. So you know, with the first wave, which was started by the Haymarket, really the anarchists were the ones that were um, sort of the target most of the time. I mean, uh, communists and socialists both were, but anarchists uh, tended to get uh, victim or tend to be villainized the most. Uh, in the 1990, or towards the, you know, World War I, um, you certainly saw people who were accused of being Bolsheviks but then you also had, because of the Galliani bombings that were taking place, uh, anarchists were heavily rounded up as well. So you had both, you know, communists and anarchists. And then by the 19, uh, 1940s, 1950s, it was mainly targeting, um, you know, what were described as communists. But regardless of what you were during that period of time, you know, if you were, you know, if if you were, you know, oftentimes those those words were used interchangeably. And so if you were an anarchist during the First World War, you were oftentimes called a Bolshevik um, or, you know, or, or vice versa, right? So, um, you know, those words were oftentimes used interchangeably. Question number six. Not that many people know during the Spanish Revolution, the anarchist movement got attacked by the communists and the fascists. Shouldn't this be a lesson to anarchists that they should not continue to trust communist groups? because they have been killed by them. Why do we see different anarcho groups using anarcho communism flags? Okay. So let me, let me deal with that last question first. Okay, anarcho communist flag doesn't mean that you're a communist. The red and black flag doesn't mean that you're a communist. Okay. What it means is that you, you know, there are different, you know, I, I hate saying this. There are different types of anarchists and some anarchists generally tend to, you know, focus their politics in different ways. You know, the anarcho-individualists, uh, there's an, you know, social anarchists, uh, which are oftentimes communists, uh, anarcho-communists or anarcho-syndicalists. But to say that you're an anarcho-communist doesn't necessarily mean that you are an advocate of state communism um, or of, of Leninism. Go ahead. Oh, the, the reason I brought this up it was even after the Spanish Revolution when anarchists got killed by communists. Why do right. we why do we continue to use that word communism, anarcho communism? Why don't we all uh, just wonder? Well, well, one, I, I think that you know anarchists, you know, if if we're looking back at at, at uh, you know early anarchism, you know, anarchism sort of stemmed from um, the same sort of branch, if you will, as as you know, state communism that we know it, or or or, or socialist as we know it, we we're rooted in the idea of collectivism, and so you know the idea of uh, of you know we've always embraced either a term of a stateless communist, libertarian communist, anarcho communist. The idea is that we're rooted in sort of a communal sort of of way of 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 um, terms of uh, sharing resources in terms of of living. Um, and so, you know, the term anarcho-communism isn't necessarily something that conflicts. Um, it just basically means that you believe in a communal form of, of existence in a way that's not necessarily organized through the state. It's really all that means. Now, yes, we do have this history of whether you're looking at Spain or you're looking at um, of, of Russia, examples of where you know, once communists have seized power, or even Cuba, once communists have seized power, you know, they generally tend tend to turn the 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 um, 
the power of the state against, against anarchists who want to continue to push the revolution and from our perspective, right? And so they'll oftentimes use the state uh, uh, apparatus as a way to suppress us and um, you know which is what you're referring to now does that mean that we shouldn't trust all communists or you know uh, or what is our relationship with with communists um, you know my thing is I'm always very skeptical of communist parties whether we're talking about things like the progressive labor party with you know this Trotskyist group or RCP or the communist or CP as a whole um, I'm usually very cynical about having any type of relationship with them um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody who identifies themselves as a communist is necessarily somebody that's an enemy. Um, you know, they may have, uh, you know, they may not be party, what I consider party, party communists. Um, you know, I know some really good commies, communists, like people like Linda Evans and Laura Whitehorn, um, who, you know, were part of the uh, new left movement, um, in the, in the 1960s and 70s. But when we've talked about what what our vision is, it's a vision that's actually very similar. Um, you know, they don't understand why I call myself an anarchist. They, I don't understand why they call, call themselves a communist, because our visions are are, are similar in terms of what we want to see in the world. Um, but you know, I, you know, like I said, I do think we need to know our history. Um, but um, I also think that you know, being an anarcho-communist or waving a black and red flag isn't necessarily the same thing as um, you know, supporting uh, state communism. Thanks for clearing that. Question number seven, how did the anarchist Black Cross get started and what kind of political prisoners does ABC support? Can you give us a short history on ABC, please? Um, the anarchist Black Cross started in 1906 uh, in Russia, expanded in 1907 um, to England and New York, 1907, 1908. Um, since then, it sort of has continued to grow. Early uh, ABC started uh, focused mainly on um, supporting Russian anarchists. Um, around 1920, it changed to the Anarchist Black Cross. It was actually originally called the Anarchist Red Cross, but it changed its name to the Anarchist Black Cross to not be confused with the political Red Cross, which was a group doing similar work. Um, our group started in um, um, 1998. Um, and has continued to exist. Um, in terms of the type of prisoners we do work with, we support uh, um, anarchist political prisoners, um, but we also support other prisoners that are part of either the struggle for um, anti-colonial movements um, or uh, anti-racist, anti-fascist movements, um, you know, or indigenous struggles, um, environmental cause, et cetera. So, you know, an example, <clears throat> Eric King, an anarchist political prisoner who is currently at FCI uh, Inglewood. Uh, he's an anarchist prisoner that uh, we've been supporting a number of years, but we also support people like Matulu Shakur, Mamiya Abu um, you know, um, Steve Martinez, who is a water protector, recently um, thrown in prison because of his refusal to cooperate with the grand jury. Um, so uh, it's individuals like that we do work with. Question number eight. Tell us about the Running Down the Walls project you've worked on over the years and how much have you raised for political prisoners? And because of this project, is ABC well known in prison? Um, so Running Down the Walls started in 1999 in Los Angeles. Um, it is basically a 5K run to uh, raise money for political prisoners and to uh, build stronger solidarity. Um, uh, between uh, the folks inside the prison and the folks outside of prison. Uh, over the years, Running Down the Walls has continued to expand uh, to various different cities throughout North America, um, as well as um, prisons. Uh, from the very first Running Down the Walls, um, we actually began to see uh, runs being organized in solidarity within the prison system. Uh, over the years, Jeez, I can't even tell you how many prisons that we've had runs in, um, but every year we have anywhere between uh, anywhere between ten and twenty uh, runs take place in various different cities and and, and prisons throughout North America. Um, over the years, we've raised tens of thousands of dollars uh, through running down the walls, which we've used that money then to turn around and, and give to the War Chest Program, which is um, 
which was a project that began in 1994. And every month it sends um, stipends to political prisoners who receive little or no financial aid. We've raised through that one program well over $130,000. Um, and then all that money has gone directly to prisoners through these monthly stipends. As of right now, we've got about 20 prisoners that receive monthly stipends um, uh, continuously. Um, so I think it certainly has built um, a reputation, uh, like I said, because we've had more runs going on in the prison. So I do think that it's running down the walls has become sort of its own thing in a life of its own. Question number nine. ABC is the longest running anarchist collective in Southern California. Over the years, many groups and collectives have broken up. I see the pattern when some people do not get their way, they have left, left to them bad mouth to the group. It's almost like they are not in it for the cause and it is all about them. How do we deal with certain activists who brings in toxic vibes and are good at dividing organizations and groups? How has ABC stayed together all these years and what is the greatest hardship ABC has faced and how did, how did it overcome it? Well, you know, I think that I'm going to go back to the issue of how do you deal with individuals that are toxic within your movement? You know, I'm going to go back to the idea that you need to, you know, have um, a strong community and you need to have an understanding about what your convictions and ideas are. Um, you know, one of the best things about ABC is that, you know, we have some individuals that have been, you know, I've been a part of the organization since 98. We have other people that have been a part of the organization since 2001. Um, and even our most recent folks have been a part of this organization, either in New York or in LA for, you know, um, you know, probably about, you know, we've developed, um, a, you know, a, a strong relationship within our collective, within our, uh, within our organization. So that way, when issues do rise, um, we can address those issues. Um, you know, ABC, much like any organization, has had you know numerous people come through our group. Uh, sometimes they stay, sometimes they don't. Um, but what I will say is that the, the the thing that has made ABC work is the fact that we we have a clear understanding about what our work is, and our you know look our our purpose is to support political prisoners, and to build relationships with those individuals and. And as you begin to develop uh, a relationship with those individuals and you try to focus most of your attention, not on uh, individual disputes between ourselves within our organization, but the fact is at the end of the day, we need to support these individuals who are going through hardship. I mentioned Eric King. Eric King has been in isolation for over a year and a half. And prior to him actually being put in isolation, he was assaulted and beaten by police. He was strapped to a, a metal bed frame for hours. And ever since that, that day, he has had um, you know, um, serious physical and mental side effects to, because of that abuse that took place. That's our priority, is supporting individuals like Eric. Um, you know, that needs to be our focus as an organization. And you know, we always say, we have a saying in our group that the work isn't done for the glory, but because we believe in mutual aid. And um, you know, it's not about us as individuals. It is about uh, our priority is about, about supporting those individuals who need us uh, and need to have a community out here. And that's what we're about. Um, and so you know, we're lucky that we have a, a, a really good group of folks that have been able to get along with each other. But I think the reason why we get along with each other is because we know what our priority and our purpose is as, as an organization. Um, and, uh, and so I think that has been the reason why we've succeeded. Now, we have certainly have had conflicts within our group. Um, you know, you're asking me to kind of give you an example, one of our greatest hardships you know, the only thing that I can think of that I'll say is that several years ago, there was, you know, you know, the anarchist movement in Los Angeles has had various different pockets. Uh, there was a period of time where there was uh, one community that really had a lot of sort of toxic um, sort of dynamics at play. And so um, we had a lot of people leave that community and enter, enter our group. Um, and we had to really stop a lot of our work um, to really sort of focus on making sure that our 
the folks that we were working with, the folks that were part of our collective were, were, were healthy. Um, because if you're not healthy and you come into a space, you know, wh whatever that space is, or you come in and develop a, a, your part of, you develop a relationship with people, which is what it means to be a part of a collective is to develop relationships, but yet you're coming at it and you have some toxicity or you have some, you're unhealthy, that whatever you create within the context of that group is also probably going to be unhealthy. And so our number one priority needed to be about making sure we were trying to get our, our folks that were joining our collective uh, and that were part of our collective as healthy as they possibly could be. Um, and, and, you know, whether or not we succeeded or failed, I think is certainly up to each person's perspective, but that was certainly something that was, was difficult. Um, you know, I, I think trying to be a part of a federation has certainly had its pros and cons as well, because it's just not a, a LA. LA is a chapter within the federation. Um, I think most of our greatest hardships have been about trying to continue and create and, and um, maintain a federation and, and learning, um, you know, learning through struggle, um, you know, not only uh, what your politics are, but also learning what your mistakes are and how to overcome and correct those. And there's certainly mistakes that we've made in LAABC in relationship to the larger federation where I think in hindsight, there's certainly things that we'd like to correct, um, you know, but um, that's, I mean, when you're part of an organization, not just within your collective, but then within a larger federation, um, you know, you're gonna have those mistakes. So it's about trying to learn from them. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Matt, because in the past, I see a couple people in the past that I personally know, they will be in a certain collective. If they don't get their way, they'll leave that collective, bad mouth them, go to the next group. And if they don't get their way again with this group, they will leave and go to another. It's like a pattern. And they'll talk really bad about the group or organization and stuff just because they didn't get their way. That's why I brought this up. And also, um, last question is this, because especially this happened last year in 2020, there were so many crazy right-wing news that's been going on and some people got so brainwashed into it and they would spread rumors on social media saying like oh the uh antifa started a fire and what all this stuff even the fbi debunked it and everything or just crazy stuff like people been posting covid 19s hoax hoax earth is flat blm and antifa blah 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 what are some actual real news we could get like independent news, like real news, not the right wing or Fox News and stuff. People could read and what we could know what's really going on. Well, I think it depends on what you're looking for. I mean, if you're looking for, you know, if you're if you're looking for just general news, I mean, obviously you've got things like CNN and LA Times and all that stuff. But if you're looking for news with a, you know, um, but they let's less corporate or, you know, as the example that you use, sort of right wing sort of lean to it. If you're looking for something that's more progressive or more radical, you know, there's obviously things like uh, indie media, um, which, you know, you know, publishes things uh, by independent media. Uh, there's obviously things like Democracy Now!, KPFK, which generally tend to be more progressive leaning. Um, you know, and then you've got, you know, websites, you know, in terms of like it's going down, which is sort of something that, you know, uh, puts news out from an anarchist perspective. And then you've got your sort of other more sort of, like I said, progressive or left leaning um, magazines like Labor Notes, Dollars and Cents, Mother Jones, Z, uh, which are, like I said, basic progressive. So, um, you know, understand that every media has its own spin or its own leaning. And, um, you know, uh, and those are some that generally tend to be more progressive or left or or anarchist that you could use as news sources. Yes, um, KPFK 90.7 FM is my favorite. Also in Northern California, California is KPFA. It's democracy. Daily brought to you by KPFK and KPFA Pacifica. <laughs> Oh, thank, thank you for the interview and explaining everything, Matt. Um, your work and everything is really appreciated in prison and also everything, all the fundraiser you do and the historical tour. And I wish you all the best and everything. Oh, funny, funny, funny thing is before we go, 
I used to fucking fall asleep at ABC meeting because they were going like three to four hours so long because you guys were so serious on what you guys do. You guys, they took it as 100% doing everything. Very interesting. And some of the stuff I couldn't understand. So Lane used to come to Luna Soul Cafe and he would do a, a study with me in, in exchange to doing like security at shows because Lane did security at Lafayette Community Center to help me out with uh, study because some of them were like some of the books I couldn't read because but it was I mean I could read it but it was so hard like really really hard but I just want to say thanks for everything thank you Jay I appreciate it